pleasant morning to all of you and welcome to the our CPD webinar organized by GMO and Society for Health Research and Innovation. Uh, and today with me, I'm going to introduce uh, our junior doctor, Dr. Sachini Vijayaratna, uh, to moderate this uh, webinar today. Uh, Dr. Sachini, are you there? Um, sorry for that uh, interaction. I think uh, there is some uh, problem with the connection. So let me start the webinar today. Um, uh, before going to the lecture, uh, please keep in mind, uh, this webinar will be recorded. And please mute your microphone and turn off the camera during this webinar. So the webinar link will be available from 9 a.m. to 9.45 a.m. to join in. Uh, no late attendees will be entertained thereafter. Each attendee should have been attended till the end of the webinar to obtain the certificate for CPD points. And the CPD points are strictly adhered to the uh, national guidelines for the CPD in medicine. This is to improve the maintain. Uh, to, this is to improve and maintain the standard of the CPD program conducted by Society for Health Research and Innovation and GMOA. And uh, thanking you for the strict adherence of the CPD regulations and uh, for your kind compliance. So the asking questions uh, after this webinar, the question time at the end of this webinar, if you have a question, please type it into the chat box and send it to us. If you have a very specific questions about your situation, please email us to the uh, shown email ID. So let's uh, move to the today's uh, topic. Uh, uh, today's topic is a crying child. Uh, and it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Hasit Narachi, consultant pediatrician from Lady Ridgeway Hospital for Children. And he is also a senior lecturer in pediatrics, Faculty of Medicine, Colombo. Thank you for joining us sir, today. And floor is yours. Good morning, Sinta. Mm -hmm. Nice to be here. Can I uh, share my screen? Can you all see my screen? Yes, sir, Hello? we can. See. You can yes. hear us. Yes, sir, yes. we can see. Can you see me as well? I yes, sir, we can see you as well. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Cynthia, for, the, for your kind introduction. And I'm Hasita. Uh, actually, uh, first I should uh, thank uh, the GMOA and uh, the Society for Health uh, Research and Innovation, uh, including uh, the nation, one of my good old school friends, uh, for the invitation uh, to conduct this uh, webinar to our junior doctors. So uh, when the nation called me a couple of weeks ago and asking me to uh, conduct a webinar and I, I asked uh, for a topic, then uh, this is the only topic uh, he uh, left to uh, invite me, left with really. So uh, to see this uh, topic, a crying child, I was also thinking uh, to start with like uh, what to tell, even though this is a common scenario that we do see in our pediatric practice, uh, but I couldn't uh, uh, remember any time that I read around this uh, uh, textbook uh, in a particular chapter like that. So I was a bit hesitant to uh, take this uh, thing up. But uh, then I realized uh, this might be very interesting as this is a very common problem and uh, everybody uh, might find it very difficult sometimes in uh, specific situations. So thank you very much again for the GMO and uh, three uh, for your invitation. And then so a crying child, okay? So that's today's topic. So uh, here, what I'm trying to do, uh, first, uh, we should identify what is CRI. So CRI is, uh, as you all know, it's a mode of communication. So then we should uh, think why, then why it is, uh, it is a problem. So it becomes a problem and when it becomes a problem. So, and we should identify at which instance we identify it as a problem. And then I'm going to talk to you on the etiology causes of crime and uh, then about the warning signs at which point uh, we are going to be worried so that is important and uh, then we will discuss about how to evaluate a crying child including history examination and relevant investigations and the management and without talking a bit uh, on infantile colic 
I don't think we can uh, complete this uh, topic. So I thought of a brief view about infantile colic as well under this. And uh, I'm going to discuss the risk management pitfalls uh, for acute uh, unexplained crying here as well. So that's what I'm uh, trying to cover in this lecture. So all infants and young children cry as a form of communication. So it is the only means they have to express a need, including basic needs like hunger, thirst, and need for affection. Moreover, it can represent significant distress like anger, discomfort, and pain. Thus, most crying is in response to hunger, discomfort, or separation, and it ceases when the needs are met. Parents often have an intuitive sense of why their babies are crying. So we don't have to uh, ask. So they know really, and they can distinguish the cries of hunger, fatigue, and discomfort from one another and address those needs in need. So healthy children cry for about three hours per day on an average at six weeks of age with a peak occurrence between 3 to 11 p.m. in the evening. This crying is normal and tends to lessen in duration and frequency after three months of age. It is important to remember that cry is a common denominator for a variety of illnesses and physiological disturbances. However, crying that persists after attempts to address routine needs and efforts to console or that is prolonged in relation to the child's baseline should be investigated to identify a specific cause. According to a vessel, it is defined as fuzzing or crying lasting for a total of three hours a day and occurring on more than three days in any one week. The incidence varies from 1.5 to 11.9 percent, depending on the case definitions and age group. It is high in infants less than three months old and decreases considerably beyond six months of age. As a presenting complaint, crying is one of the most common indications for parents to seek medical attention in the first three months of life. A variety of terminologies are used to describe it, such as incessant cry, persistent cry, excessive cry, and problem crying. Causes of crying in majority are functional and in minority, it may vary from a trivial illness to a life-threatening disease. Now let's have a look at common and pathological causes of crying. Excessive tiredness. This is considered if the infant's uh, total sleep duration for 24 hours falls more than an hour short of the average for their age. At birth, the normal sleep requirement is around 16 to 18 hours which reduces up to 15 hours at two, three months of age. Six years old baby generally becomes tired after being awake for one and a half hours. It is around two hours for three months old. Please make a note that all these numbers may vary according to the individual baby and sociocultural differences in the family dynamic. That's why this is challenging. Other common reason could have been hunger. This is more likely in a situation where the baby is not gaining expected weight. This is a complete list of pathological uh, etiologies for excessive crime. What you have to remember is that it could be related to any system or organ in the body. Hence, a head to toe examination is very important. You don't have to remember all this. You might be already knowing about this, but uh, missing one single part might lead to a catastrophe. Okay. What are the pointers for underlying organic causes, or in other words, red flag? When the onset of cry is being sudden, when there is a lack of dynal rhythm, 
So we expect uh, them to cry more or less around uh, the evening time. But if it is not there anymore, and then persistence of crying beyond four months of age, when there is undue lethargy, and presence of fever, especially in an infant less than eight to 12 weeks of age. Presence of respiratory distress like tachypnea, recessions, uh, sinuses, and deep respiration. And even vomiting, especially uh, if it is associated with the uh, blood or bile. Constipation or diarrhea with blood and mucus. And uh, with the presence of failure to thrive. Skin bruising and abrasions. History of parental postnatal depression. So these are the clues for an underlying pathology. So then how to evaluate a child presenting with crying? This becomes more challenging when cry is the only sign at presentation. The element of missing out a small percentage of underlying serious illness adds stress to the healthcare professional. A thorough, systematic, and appropriate history and physical examination are needed. Additionally, a broad range of medical possibilities coupled with care give a concern need to be considered to ensure proper evaluation. Remember, parents are excellent observers and are often able to find subtle signs and symptoms for us. In the history, the initial impression is an observational assessment based on the visual and auditory presentation of the patient when first encounter, first look impression. Our first task is to establish whether the cry is significant. To achieve this, we should focus on the onset of crying, duration, response to attempts to console, and frequency or uniqueness of episodes. Mind you again, parents are excellent observers and are often able to find subtle signs and symptoms. So please get involved them in your assessment. It is very important. Parents should be asked about associated events or conditions, including recent immunizations, trauma, interaction with a sibling, infections, drug use, relationship of crying with feeding and bubble movements. Review of symptoms focuses on symptoms of positive disorder, including gastrointestinal, respiratory, and trauma. Past medical history should not previous episodes of crying and conditions that and potential predisposed to crime, like history of heart disease or developmental delay. Physical examination should begin with ABC, ARV breathing circulation, and then a thorough examination for signs of trauma or medical illness, followed by notes on how the parents are interacting with the child. The infant of, or child is undressed and examined from head to toe. This is very, very, very important. Uh, to ensure complete examination, including genitalia. Oscultory examination focuses on signs of respiratory infection and cardiac compromise. When evaluating crying child, high index of suspicion is warranted. Parental concern is an important variable. When concern is high, the clinician should be careful even when there are no conclusive findings because the parents may be reacting subconsciously to subtle but significant changes. This is very, very important. Conversely, a very low level of concern, particularly if there is lack of parental interaction to the infant or child can indicate a bonding problem or an inability to assess and manage the child's needs. Inconsistency in the history and the child's clinical presentation should raise concerns about possible abuse. When analyzing the cry, the time frame is helpful. Crying that has been intermittent over a number of days is of less concern than sudden and constant crying. Whether the cry is exclusive to a time of day or night is also helpful. For example, recent onset crying at night in an otherwise happy and healthy infant or child may be consistent with separation and sight or sleep-associated issues. The character of the cry is also revealing. 
parents can distinguish a cry that is painful in character from a frantic or scared cry. It is also important to determine the level of acuity. An inconsolable infant or child is of more concern than an infant or child who is well appearing and consolable with us. Remember that high pitch cry may indicate an underlying sinus infection in young infants. A continuous cry associated with grunting may indicate respiratory pathology, including a foreign body. Screaming baby with pulling at ears may indicate underlying acute arthritis media. Intermittent bouts of crying associated with pallor with knees drawn up or the abdomen may indicate in the perception. Now you might have understood uh, how to analyze a cry up to a certain extent. It is important to distinguish the general area of concern. For example, when there is fever, it is likely to be due to an infection. Respiratory distress without fever indicates possible cardiac etiology or pain. Abnormalities in bowel habits like diarrhea may consistent with the GI pathology. Remember that specific findings often suggest certain etiologies. In the process of evaluation, no testing is necessary unless specific abnormalities are detected by history and examination. The role of investigations in identifying the cause of crying infants is limited. According to a few cohort studies, it may help only in 3 to 5% of cases where history and examination findings are inconclusive. When there are few or no specific clinical findings and no testing is immediately indicated, close follow up and re evaluation are appropriate. There's no set diagnostic evaluation for an infant with excessive crying, rather, it is specific to the suspected diagnosis. Laboratory studies and radiological imaging of an uh, infant with excessive crying are driven by the differential diagnosis. For example, if uh, concern for pyloric stenosis or intersection, an abdominal ultrasound scan is the appropriate imaging study. This flowchart summarizes what we have been discussing up to now. So you can see uh, if you get a we get a uh, child with uh, or an infant with uh, excessive crying. You're going to take a good uh, detailed history and uh, examine the child. And you may request or might not request uh, investigation depending on the scenario. But uh, using uh, these evaluation techniques, most of the time, uh, in 95% of cases, 90 to 95% you ended up being having a functional cause. That means non-organic cause, okay? Could be due to a wet diaper or being uh, hungry, so due to uh, behavioral issues. But uh, in small percentage of cases, you might encounter uh, an organic cause. It could be anything from febrile or infective causes to surgical causes, okay? Therapeutic interventions uh, in the excessively crying infant are prompted by physiologic abnormalities, findings on examination, and suspected underlying causes. The underlying organic disorder should be treated. For example, suspicion of meningitis mandates early broad spectrum intravenous antibiotics. I thought this topic is incomplete without uh, covering infantile colic, which is frequent and extended periods of crying for no clear reason in an otherwise healthy infant. Colic is described by the rule of three. Crying that lasts for more than three hours per day, for more than three days per week, lasting for three weeks in an otherwise healthy infant between three weeks and three months of life. This typically appears within the first month of life, takes around six weeks and spontaneous resolved by three to four months of age. Paroxysms of crying and fuzziness often occur at about the same time of the day or night and continue for hours for no apparent reason. 
a few infants cry almost incessantly. Although the term colic suggests an intestinal origin, it is unknown. Typically, colic infants eat well and gain weight, although vigorous non nutritive sucking may suggest excessive hunger. So, excessive crying may cause erophagia, which results in flatulence and abdominal distension. However, it is important to note that infant colic is a diagnosis of exclusion, and the acute presentation of excessive crying may indicate a significant pathology. Treatment strategies for infant colic include behavioral interventions, dietary modifications, and drugs. Behavioral interventions should be tried first as it has documented efficacy. If they fail to produce relief, drug and dietary management may be tried. A noteworthy intervention called REST, rest nursing regime, for babies and parents is found to be but useful in reducing infant crying and parental stress. This can be applied to babies and parents separately. Stress for infants consists of art regulation. Here we need to prevent overstimulation and overtiredness. Watch for early warning signs, assist in state transitions, and limit crying jacks by catching them early. For very active and restless infants, Keeping swaddle title it might help. It is important to understand that the fatigue often contributes to excessive crying. So parents should be instructed to routinely lay the infant in the crib while the infant is awake to encourage health soothing and good sleep habits and to prevent the infant from becoming dependent on the parents. Talking movement, a pacifier, or specific noise may help them to fall asleep. Entrainment E. Synchronizing the infant behavior with environmental stimuli, such as light or noise, is important. An infant's swing, singing, and playing white noise may be tried. White noise has a soothing effect on crying and irritable infant. It is a steady stream of subtle, monotonous sound arising from a vacuum cleaner, air dryer, car engine, waterfall, or rain shower. S for structure. Structured routines include the bathing and playtime, as well as consistent sleeping and feeding time of this baby should be ensured. T for touch. Soothing techniques such as holding or rocking and general measures like firmly holding the baby, swaddling and massaging might be very useful in comforting the baby. Rest for parents includes are for reassurance from the healthcare provider. Parents should be reassured that the infant is healthy, that the irritability is not due to poor parenting, and the colic will resolve on its own with no long term adversity. E for empathy. Empathy from the healthcare provider is equally important. Physicians should offer reassurance that they understand how stressful a colic infant can be for parents. That's for support. Support from the healthcare provider is also vital. Time out. T. For the parents, is also valuable. If they are feeling frustrated, to take a break from a crying baby and put the infant on or child down in a safe environment for a few minutes, educating parents and giving permission to take a break are helpful in preventing abuse. Supplying resources for support services to parents who seem overwhelmed may prevent future concerns as well. All in all, here we should address the mother's emotional state and the mother-baby relationship. As all comforting measures will not work for, work for everyone, parents should be guided to identify a unique comfort, comforting technique that is suitable for their own infant. Then we will move into dietary interventions, failing behavior modification. Sometimes in the breastfed infants, eliminating cow's milk or stimulants food like coffee, tea, cola drinks, and chocolates from the mother's diet brings relief, as may stopping drugs that contain stimulants like nasal fecal 
For formula fitter, maybe it's a hypoallergenic formula, maybe try to determine whether infants have cow's milk protein intolerance. But frequent formula switching should be avoided. In extreme cases, mild sedation and temporary hospitalization is indicated. Dicyclamide and antimuscarin, which has been shown to reduce infant crying effectively in two randomized control trials. This cough apnea and seizures should be considered before recommending this medication. Simatitol, a commonly prescribed medication in Sri Lanka, is relatively safe but has no proven effect on infant crying when compared with placebo in randomized control trials. Let's go through the key points of infantile colic again. Colic is excessive crying for no clear reason in an otherwise healthy infant. Colic should disappear by age three to four months. Thorough history and physical examination would rule out medical causes of crying. Hence, the testing is unnecessary unless there are specific findings present with the child. In spite of behavioral, physical, and dietary measures, often colic resolves only with time. Colic probably has no relationship to development of an insistent inpatient fertility. This is important. Sometimes the parents are highly worried about it. So then, uh, let's discuss a few risk management withdrawals, which uh, might be quite useful in day-to-day -day life as clinician. The baby did not have fever, so I did not consider that he could have serious infection. Remember that sepsis and other significant infections can present as crying alone or in conjunction with other findings. An infant may not manifest fever as a sign of infection, or conversely, he may be even hypothermic. Especially, this is common among newborns. The message is for a crying infant, all serious etiologies, including infection, should be considered and investigated when appropriate, with or without the presence of fever. Of course, the baby had an elevated heart rate. He was crying. We all know that crying can often lead to tachycardia in infants. However, tachycardia can be manifestation of infection, dehydration, evolving fever, pain, or even distress. Vital signs should be taken repeatedly on crying infants, both in crying and non-crying state to avoid inappropriately attributing abnormal findings to crying rather than other potentially serious underlying causes. I had a bad feeling about this baby, but how I feel, I shouldn't impact my investigation. As with parental concern, clinician concern and gut instinct regarding pediatric pathology has been supported as an accurate tool in determining a serious illness. So, Clinicians should acknowledge their concern and factor their intuition into an evaluation of a crying infant. The parents seem really nice, so there's no need to consider non accidental trauma. Unfortunately, it is almost impossible to predict which caregiver may cause non accidental trauma. It must be considered in any infant with persistent or unexplained crying, regardless of a family stature or protestation. Remember that we cannot miss a single case of NAI. All babies cry, this is the normal finding and it's nothing to worry about. While some amount of crying is normal in all infants, any crying that exceeds the duration of or quality of the infant's typical crying is concerning to parents or is accompanied by a change in behavior should be considered significant and potentially pathologic until through another wife. The spectrum of normal crying for an infant is variable by age and by individual infant. So caregiver descriptions of deviations should be taken seriously. If I'm not going to perform any diagnostic tests, such as blood, urine, or imaging, I should just send this baby home. There's no reason for him to sit around in the ball. Observation and serial examinations are paramount to the evaluation of a crying infant for whom a diagnosis is not immediately clear. This may allow for the acquisition of additional information to guide 
further testing allow for clinicians and caregivers to follow a trajectory of illness and provide relief for stressed caregivers and time for education. The more tests I perform, the closer I will be making a diagnosis. This is wrong. There's no one test or series of tests universally recommended for the evaluation of a crying infant. History and physical examination remains a cornerstone of diagnosis in crying infants. We can think testing is expensive, invasive and inappropriate for most infants who present to the hospital with acute unexplained crime. This baby just has colic. Be cautious. Colic and unexplained crying are common diagnosis, but should only be applied to infants for whom other etiologies for acute crying have been considered first. This baby seems fine. There's no need for this family to follow up with their primary care provider. Close follow-up is critical for crying infants evaluated in the hospital. First, it ensures a second visit to document improvement or worsening for diagnosed conditions in which treatment may have been instituted. Second, it allows an additional diagnostic examination for infants in whom the hospital visit was unrevealing and in whom an illness may now be more apparent. Lastly, it ensures a session with the primary care provider, someone who can provide reassurance and support to the family on a more long-term basis. And the last one I'm going to discuss. Parents are always anxious about their babies, but it doesn't mean anything is truly wrong with infants. The degree of parental concern has been shown to correlate with disease severity in infants. Parents can differentiate the cries of their infants and can intuit pathology as well. Parental concern should be one of the multiple features to factor in the evaluation of a crying infant and should not be dismissed by health care providers. Okay, so that's the end of it. And uh, so in this uh, short uh, lecture, I try to explain what is crime and, uh, and in which instance uh, we consider it as abnormal because we all know it's a mode of communication. And uh, then we list the causes of crime, uh, varying from functional to more pathological. Then we talked about uh, red flags, the warning signs and symptoms, which might help us to diagnose uh, more significant pathology, organic causes of uh, excessive crime. And then we talked about how to evaluate a crying child or an infant, including a complete history and uh, examination and relevant investigations, which might not be relevant in most of the time, and the uh, management aspects. And uh, under the management, actually, uh, while I'm talking to you about the infantile colic, we basically manage the, the whole spectrum of functional causes of uh, excessive crime. And at the end, uh, we discuss about uh, few risk management pitfalls for acute unexplained crime. So that is the end of it. And uh, I would value uh, your questions. Thank you very much sir, for that uh, excellent lecture. And uh, this is the time for queries. Uh, let me check the chat box whether what are the questions from our participants. So there's a question from my, one one of the participants. Uh, could you please briefly explain red flags for crying baby? Okay. I have yeah, I have uh, discussed that in length, I think. Because it's all something which is not uh, compatible or matching with the scenario uh, should be taken as a, a red flag. 
it could be uh, something which you might be able to measure or might not be able to measure even uh, the parental concern if it is a uh, inappropriate is a red flag or any abnormal examination finding which you, you might not be able to explain uh, then should be taken it as uh, a red flag so I, I cannot list out it, uh, even though I have done it up to a certain extent, uh, I might not be able to do it. Uh, 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 so it's just something not matching to the that particular scenario should be taken as a red flag. Thank you very much, sir. And a few more queries we have got from the participant. Uh, if the baby has recurrent constipation, what is the best management? Okay, <laughs> this is uh, one of the commonest uh, uh, presentations uh, uh, which do uh, we as pediatricians uh, come across. Constipation is a um, wide identity. So first we should uh, exclude the pathological causes for constipation. Once we have excluded that, then we are left with uh, the functional constipation. So it's like uh, there are main like three main areas to be addressed so the so one area is uh, you should address on the diet and the fluids the second area is uh, the toilet toilet habits and the third area is the drug medication so with young children infants and uh, toddlers the first two areas cannot be addressed at all but you can't push them to eat fruits or vegetables anyway uh, they are very poor eaters so you can't push any more and with this constipation they are being disturbed further uh, so only the other thing is the uh, the fluids the same you cannot you can ask but you might not uh, get a good response and the second thing is uh, the toilet habits. So when you get the urge, you go to the toilet and empty your bubble. But that's not going to happen with these young ones because of the pain that they perceive. They are reluctant to empty their bubble. So they are holding. And actually, they are not uh, supporting. They are doing what, whatever we, the, the reverse thing, whatever we want them to do. So the opposite, they are doing the opposite. So it's really hard because of those two reasons, because there's no response for the first two uh, uh, areas of management. The only area, the only modality uh, that we are left with is the medication drugs. So the thing is here, uh, lactulose, uh, the osmotic, uh, the laxative is the commonly used uh, drug and it's very safe, not being absorbed. So can be given a quite a high dose as well, but we have to make sure the child is going to drink plenty of sweets. So that can be, uh, that is our first, first child. And then we may get the help of uh, the polyethylglycol, uh, PEG, uh, but in, in selected cases. So oral route is always preferred over the, the rectal route. Okay. And uh, the duration is a problem. Usually you may good uh, you may get good results uh, within a couple of weeks. Then you tend to uh, tell it all so quickly. Don't do that. Because uh, even though you empty the whole bubble, still the child is not ready to open the bubble. Is not releasing the external anal sphincter. So, if the drugs are not pushing the feces out, so he will be in the same position after a few more weeks. So, you might have to continue these medications for some time until baby or the child is ready to open the bowel. So, it could vary from weeks to sometimes years. I have uh, use these medications for years for certain children. But that is very important because otherwise their whole 
behavior is going to be disturbed with this. Okay. I think you would have understood to a certain level. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. So one more question regarding hiccups. Is it normal the hiccups are in newborn child? Yes, it's quite normal because uh, newborns are uh, uh, infants like uh, they are uh, they are they are sucking their mum's uh, nipple or breast. So we are also swallowing some amount of air. They are swallowing more. So their stomach is uh, partially filled with air more than others. So that is the reason they are thinking of. There's no clear reason. But in infants, uh, it's not a problem at all. We don't have to uh, start any medication. Usually, by uh, adhering uh, to proper attachment and uh, proper burping techniques, we might be able to get it off uh, this process. As you said, next step, but not completely. Thank you, sir. Uh, that was a good explanation. Uh, I think there are no more questions. If you have any questions, please write it in the chat box. Uh, yes, yeah, sir, we have received one more question. Uh, rec the rectal dew collax can be used baby age four months. Dalcolax, no? Dalcolax. Yeah. Dalcolax, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's the spelling. Yeah. Uh, yes. Dalcolax, yeah. Yeah. Uh, if it, because usually for a uh, younger one, we don't uh, really need stimulants. Uh, just need a bit of stimulation around that area. So uh, ideal thing would have been uh, the glycerin suppository. Unfortunately, time to time, it is not available. So uh, in that case, I would uh, uh, advise, this is a personal practice really, uh, to get a thermometer and to apply a bit of uh, olive oil uh, to the H and with that insert it uh, for about uh, uh, centimeter or centimeter and just to uh, like stimulate uh, the anal area so that that is what is important uh, we don't really need a medication here uh, so if uh, you have got uh, uh, the the glycerin uh, suppository that would be the uh, best but if you fail uh, then you may consider even in, uh, in especially in resistant cases you may consider tamoxifen there's no contraindication and such, but uh, you don't require it most of the time. Thank you, sir. Uh, one more question we have received so just now. Uh, G-O-R-D and crying child, a word about it, please. Okay, it's again a, a broad area. Uh, not really been uh, clearly uh, explored really. Because uh, G-O-R, G-O-R-D, uh, two, two different entities, okay? So naturally, uh, these young ones are uh, refluxing. So we consider it as a GOR. It becomes a disease, GORD, uh, when there are complications associated with that, like by the uh, failure to thrive or uh, recurrent wheeze or uh, being very irritable and like uh, uh, difficult to like a crying baby. Okay. So when those uh, things are there, only we consider it as a disease. So when it becomes a disease, you might have to address it. Okay. But unless there are complications of it, you don't have to uh, be worried. But you need a lot of uh, reassurance because parents are highly anxious. Because when, when things are coming out of their nostrils, they are really worried because uh, they think something is uh, really abnormal with their on babe. So we have to reassure them. This is quite normal. And this uh, child will uh, uh, get away with this problem uh, over the time. So just wait. So, but uh, the simple measures like uh, proper attachment and then uh, proper burping, good attachment, proper burping, and uh, uh, might help. And uh, small frequent feeds also might help and uh, keeping the baby at an correct position after a feed uh, might also help. And uh, try with these simple measures. Most of the time, uh, uh, they will achieve a good success. Usually this disappears by the age of uh, six months, 
six to eight months uh, when they start uh, taking complementary feeding solids and uh, they can sit up or stand by that stage, uh, uh, this uh, problem will disappear on its own. But if there are complications, uh, which I have mentioned, then there's a place for medication as well, apart from what I have mentioned before. So only evidence-based medication is omiprazole. Okay, none of the other medication like we have been prescribing so many medications like uh, uh, regular domperidone uh, or gabiscan or uh, mm, so many. Uh, so I think so many medications have been prescribed for this problem. But mind you, none of those are not going to work. But in uh, in extreme cases, you might have to consider some of these, but not for a uh, long term for a short term you have to be careful especially with this uh, prokinetic domperidone if you're going to prescribe for a long time be careful about the cardiac side effects okay there's a risk of arrhythmia and all so sudden infant death might be the outcome so you have to be careful in okay, respect to this med medication but for a case like uh, extreme uh, uh, you may consider uh, long course of omiprazole use evidence based Thank you very much, sir. Uh, and the last question is, if otitis media is suspected, uh, do we need to admit the child? I think it's a broad question. There should be a question <laughs> for admission. Well, what I'm, what I'm getting uh, <laughs> separate topics to be discussed. OK, uh, but that's good. Uh, that's how this should be. I'm really happy. Uh, so otitis media. OK, uh, if it is really otitis media in a very young infant, you need to uh, start IV antibiotics. They become really ill. They become septic. If it is otitis external or mild degree of otitis media, then you might be able to uh, uh, manage uh, those infants uh, keeping at home. But uh, for a for a toddler or older infant, uh, you may start uh, oral antibiotics, but you might have to assess the child and decide because uh, if they are uh, having high fever spikes and in looking. In that case, uh, there's no place for oral antibiotics. Uh, in that case, child needs admission and uh, intravenous antibiotics. Yes, uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, I think that's all the questions we have got so far. And uh, once again, I would like to thank you, sir, on behalf of GMO and Society for Health Research and Innovation, for an excellent presentation today and uh, for your precious time to spend with us today. So thank you very much. Thank you, Cynthia. And thank you uh, very much for the audience and uh, your active participation. Uh, and uh, again, uh, thank uh, GMO and the three, including my friend uh, Dinesh uh, for the invitation. I'm really glad to be here. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. So we have come for the end of the lecture and the webinar today. So thank you for your participation. Find the link in the chat box, kindly give your feedback, answer the post assessment questions and receive your e-certificate for the participation. And once again, I would like to mention the CPD points, uh, what you are going to uh, receive from the e-certificate are strictly adhered to the national guidelines of the CPD Center in Medicine Sri Lanka. So once again, find the link in the chat box, kindly give your feedback, answer the post assessment questions and receive your e-certificate for your participation. Thank you for your participation today and have a good day.